Hi guys, this is JasonO.com and I'm here with a review of the Samsung Galaxy S23 FE 5G. So it's a fan edition that has come a bit late because uh, we didn't have a Galaxy S22 FE and it comes after the S21 FE. It's uh, more related to the S22 series than the S23 on account of it having the same Exynos 2200 CPU of the, well, S22 generation. Now the handset here has a 6.4 inch diagonal. It has pretty much a similar camera setup with uh, the predecessor, although it changes the main sensor and also a glass back and a metal frame. Uh, least compromises have been made, less compromises have been made regarding the design. The price is around $600. It's a high mid-range phone. It competes with the likes of the Xiaomi 13T Pro and the Nothing Phone 2. Now let's get straight to it. It's a bit of a beefy phone. 8.2 millimeters and 209 grams. It comes in purple, but it's also available in other hues like mint, like green graphite and indigo and as well as tangerine. The camera protrudes a bit via these rings, an approach familiar since the S21 series, and it's got IP68 certification, meaning it can take some water and dust. For a 6.4 inch phone, it's quite large. I'm talking about its length and width, and the screen uh, bezels are quite thick for a Galaxy S series device. Closer to a Galaxy A, if you ask me. I mean, the build is solid and all, but the back is glossy and draws a few fingerprints. As far as the screen is concerned, what we have here is a uh, Dynamic AMOLED 2X 6.4 inch panel, and uh, it's got a Full HD Plus resolution. It's got 120 Hz refresh rate, HDR10 Plus, and delivers a bright and crisp experience. Gorilla Glass 5 protection, by the way, which is a step back from Gorilla Glass Victus of the predecessor. Um, a wide range of colors, a large dynamic range, and also at the same time wide view angles and excellent contrast in the sunlight. It's a bright panel with lovely colors as usual for the OLEDs, which Samsung proposes. Okay, now aside from that, we also did a bunch of measurements. So let's see how those panned out. 760 lux units, that's how much we achieved here, which is superior to the Asus Zenfone 10 and the um, Huawei Mate 50 Pro. It's below the Honor 90 and below the Samsung Galaxy A34, as well as below the Realme GT3. Now, moving further, we can talk about the CPU on this handset here. And the CPU, as I said before, should be familiar. Samsung Exynos 2200, 4 nanometer, um, was present on the Galaxy S22 series, octa-core, and in some parts of the world, it's replaced by Snapdragon 8 Gen 1. It's got that cool GPU Xclipse, which has AMD technology and supposedly ray tracing. Now, as far as the RAM is concerned, Samsung uh, felt a bit uh, skimpy on this one. So only eight gigs available here and LPDDR5 at least, plus 256 gigabytes of storage, but there's also 128 gigabyte version. There's no micro SD, there's no lag, but there is some heat that appears in games every once in a while. More intense games will have a bit more heat. And we also have throttling, as you can see here. After about 10 minutes of the test, you're going to lose up to 36% of performance. And the temperature jumps to 50 degrees or so. So intensive activities may lead to higher temperatures. Now, as far as the benchmarks are concerned, we have them here. We start with Antutu 10, where we have a pretty respectable score, placing us above the OnePlus Open and a Pixel 8 Pro, but also below the Realme GT3 and the Nothing Phone 2. Okay, so in Geekbench 6 multi-core, we surpassed the Xiaomi 13T Pro as well as the Honor 90, but we scored below the Pixel 8 Pro and the iPhone, excuse me, the Xiaomi 13 Pro. Okay, so when it comes to the GPU, I was actually a bit underwhelmed because in 3D Mark, while we may be set here pretty high above the OnePlus Nord 3 and Motorola H40, these are actually older phones which we surpassed, the newer ones beat us, like the Motorola H40 Pro and a few others like uh, Realme GT3. And if you look at the Wildlife Extreme, once again, not very highly placed, just fighting last year phones and mid-rangers rather than flagships. So the GPU is a bit of a letdown, if you ask me. Time has passed, that's for sure. When it comes to the temperature, in benchmarks we achieve 45 degrees Celsius, which is definitely higher than we would have wanted it to be. Now, uh, battery-wise, we have a 4,500 mAh unit, the same one as the Galaxy S21 Fan Edition, the predecessor. The charging is 25 watts via wire, there's also the wireless charging and even reverse wireless charging. We did a bunch of battery tests and we achieved 16 hours and 25 minutes of continuous video playback, which is pretty okay. It's not exactly a record breaker, 
um, it's above the Galaxy S21 Fan Edition by about two hours. It's the equal of the S22 series or within the margin of error. And it's also above the Redmi Note 12 Pro Plus. It is below the Honor 90 and below the Nothing Phone 2, pay attention, by 11 hours. So I expect it better. PC mark is just decent, 10 hours and 28 minutes. It may be above the Galaxy S21 Fan Edition and the Huawei Nova 11 Pro, but it's once again below the Nothing Phone 2 and the Honor 90, which are some of the main rivals of the phone. Charging is a bit on the long side, 1 hour and 14 minutes. We don't get a bundle charger in the box, just so you know, and after 30 minutes you should be at 55%, which is not exactly bad. Now, when it comes to acoustics, we have a stereo, excuse me, stereo set of speakers here, one at the bottom, one at the top, which is the earpiece, and we don't have an audio jack, but you do have quite a few settings for this experience. So if you go here, and then you go here, you're going to get Dolby Atmos, Dolby Atmos for gaming, an equalizer with all of these music options and customs, and also these modes. Okay, and now I think it's time to listen to some. So a bunch of ideas, excellent volume, it can cover a conversation in a small room, uh, plenty of bass and uh, well-defined high notes, satisfying voices when you're listening to podcasts. So it's a pretty good all-rounder. I don't have much to complain about when it comes to this uh, set of speakers. They're actually quite solid. We have a bunch of tests here, uh, measured with a decibel meter. So uh, uh, the top speaker achieved 78.6 decibels with an acoustic sample and the bottom one 82.5 decibels. With this value, we surpassed the OnePlus 11 and Asus Zenfone 10, but we scored below the Nothing Phone 2 and the Huawei Nova 11 Pro. When it comes to gaming, we achieved 97.1 decibels, which is superior to the Huawei Nova 11 Pro and to the S21 Fan Edition. It's below the Xiaomi 13T Pro and the Realme GT3. Now we move on to the camera system and we start with the front camera, which is a 10 megapixel shooter, much like you've seen on the Galaxy S devices, higher Galaxy S's, while the previous S21 fan edition had a 32 megapixel shooter. Sadly, no autofocus this time around, but at least there's 4K 60 frames per second capture. At the back side, the main camera from the previous model, which was a 12 megapixel shooter, has been replaced by a 50 megapixel cam with OIS f1.8 aperture and a Samsung GN sensor, the same one as the one found on the S22 and S23 basic models. It takes 12 megapixel shots and then there is an 8 megapixel telephoto camera with 3x optical zoom. Um, it's basically the same one from the S21 fan edition and there's also 12 megapixel ultra wide camera without autofocus, sadly. Now we move further and I have to show you some of the pictures we've taken here. Um, it's a full on Christmas in the capital of Romania, Bucharest. So we have 287 shots. First, let's talk about the daytime ones. Okay, so this one is a pretty pragmatic and realistic phone. The colors are a bit on the cold side, but the sky has been uh, pretty well represented by these uh, digital creations. The greens and the blues are particularly well rendered. The reds, I feel, not as much. And uh, uh, while uh, the ultra wide camera is pretty clear and crisp, on the sides you'll see some deformation as it usually happens on ultra wides. But at least the colors don't change that much. And finally, the zoom test. So this is uh, about 3x, 5x, and then we get to 8x, which is actually not bad. Digital zoom. Okay, even more shots here. The sky is actually the one that impressed me the most, color-wise, texture-wise, and detail-wise. And this is an ultra-wide version of the same shot without losing much of the colors. I have here a bunch of, sel bunch of selfies, but I'm going to skip them in favor of those showing hair. Okay, uh, moving further, a bunch of architectural scenarios here in Bucharest. Lovely blue hue and a bunch of cats zoomed in with excellent fur texture. Even though we are losing some details in between the steps of the optical zoom. Pretty bright greens in spite of me saying that they're correctly calibrated, but in general the vegetation was uh, well captured when it comes to the uh, realism of the shots. A regular shot, ultra wide shot, as you can see for yourself. Even some close ups we managed to capture. There are roses in December still. I mean, you won't get macros, but you will get pretty close up with these close ups. And a lot of details here for 2 megapixel shots resulting from a 50 megapixel camera. I promised you selfies and here we are. Um, the details are there, they're quite fine for a 10 megapixel camera. And also the bokeh does a fine job at separating the subject from the background. Uh, I would say it's 
on par with the Galaxy S22 series, that's what we're getting here selfie-wise, and an upgrade from the predecessor, which from what I remember didn't exactly impress me that much. The bokeh is actually more correctly applied than I would have expected from a Samsung phone. Okay, even more shots of architecture, churches and buildings, with correct colors, lots of details, and a pretty crisp image overall. Not much to complain about. This is typical Galaxy S behavior, I would say typical Galaxy S22 behavior, that's the level we're at. It's above what the Nothing Phone 2 is offering and on par with the Xiaomi 13T Pro. Maybe with an extra color boost for the 13T Pro which has the Leica on its side. Even more buildings. When it comes to architecture and traveling, this should be a pretty good phone for you and the blues and the greens are the stars here. We're also trying out some reds which are more dull and settled compared to the reds captured by other phones. It actually reminds me of the iPhone because the iPhone has uh, calmer and cooler colors. So these are the daytime shots. We also have some food shots here. And I advise you not to use the food mode because that's what happens. Things get weirdly colored. So these croutons are colored like this. With the food mode, they're colored like this. It's a bit of an exaggeration in order to make things pop up. This is the food mode exaggeratedly red. This is without the food mode with an extra bit of texture. So yeah, your choice. Okay, so let's talk about the night now. One thing is for sure, I was disappointed by the pictures taken by the camera without the night mode. I advise you to always use the night mode, otherwise you'll be let down by huge streetlight halos, some blur with moving cars and some other weird halos happening all around. So I could barely make out the writing here. Christmas wishes. I had to actually go ahead and use night mode to make it clearer and also highlight the trees from here. So yeah, definitely use it. This is a regular shot and uh, this is an ultra wide shot. So be advised and use plenty of night mode. This is an underwhelming picture of a beautiful house in uh, Bucharest. But when you're trying the night mode, things will get much better. This is washed out, unimpressive, and you can barely see the candy cane real colors, but with night mode, things get solved pretty fast. Although the contrast is a bit too intense for some people's liking. Regular shot, night mode shot, which actually gives some color to the image. So the lighting here is basic yellow, but with night mode you can tell the difference between these lights, these lights, these ones and these ones, which are colored differently. Oh, by the way, excellent bokeh of a statue here with several effects applied. So yeah, that's it. When it comes to the zoom, this is actually 3x zoom and the camera can not exactly face the distance and it cannot handle the lights that well. So use the night mode. That's the main tip I'm giving you. So these are the videos taken with this phone. I'm going to start with the selfie one because it's easier. It does a pretty well, a pretty nice job at separating me from the background. This is a bokeh video. It feels like one of those mini documentaries on National Geographic showing us what the scenario is all around us. One of the best separations I've seen recently, on par with the Galaxy S, I mean a pricier one. Uh, very good bokeh and superior to the, I would say, superior to the iPhone one. Okay, now, as far as zooming is concerned, not very impressed by what is produced here. Zooming in on the seagulls, even a 3x I can spot some uh, noise and that's not flattering. Okay, now this is a regular panning in 4K. Pretty nice colors, although a bit on the colder side, like I said for the photos. Lovely blues and uh, greens. We have some stabilization tests as well. This is the first one in 4K, 30 frames per second, and it's actually not half bad. We're ascending stairs and they're walking a straight line. However, the super steady one is a bit of a letdown. Super steady forces you to go with full HD, 30 frames per second. Things get a bit, uh, well, vibrating. As you, as you can see, it's a bit shakier than expected, even though it's super steady. Somehow the standard stabilization mode fares better than this one. And we have more color here in case you were wondering, with some extra music. It's close to sunset, but the colors are still pretty satisfying. 
all in all, it's pretty much on par with what you would have achieved with a flagship in 2022 not 2023, because I feel that there's an extra level of crispness which the S23 series and the OnePlus 11, for example, have. This is the nighttime scenario, and it's a very crowded place here. Honestly, not very impressed by the nighttime capture. The lights are pretty big, there's a lot of noise. So yeah, this seems to be the Achilles heel of the smartphone. You can also notice that here. A lot of contrast. Some of the light sources are exaggerated a bit and quite a bit of noise, particularly if you watch this video and you focus on this area here where people are crossing the street, you notice a lot of noise. It doesn't feel like a flagship, more like a mid-range phone. And we also have this area here. Once again, quite a bit of noise if seen on a larger screen. Okay, we're done with the camera. I would say that all in all, it's still above the nothing phone too and on par with the Xiaomi 13T Pro. Now let's talk about connectivity. This device is able to deliver Wi-Fi 6E, Bluetooth 5.3. It also has GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, BDS, NFC and a an USB-C port at the bottom, probably USB-C 3.0 or even 3.2. The calls were pretty loud and clear and when it came to the, well, speed test, we have the results here and they're quite satisfying. When it comes to Wi-Fi, 733 mega per second in download, 797 mega per second upload. When it comes to 5G, as high as 968 mega per second in download and 156 mega per second in upload, I would say we are doing fine. Now we move on to the OS, which when the phone launched, it was Android 13 and One UI 5.1. In the meantime, it received Android 14 and One UI 6.0. At its core, we have the same um, we have the same news feed here, which you can see. We also have the recent section here, plus the ability to split the screen. And for security, you have the fingerprint scanner in the screen of the optical variety and working pretty fast. And here you can see that there is novelty. The novelty here comes in the form of, well, changes for the quick settings. We have extra transparency, changes in the button placement and the layout. They've changed some of the places. You can see that the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth are placed at the top now, and some of the features are placed in a handy manner. We have Dex here and linked windows uh, closer to you, and a separation of the brightness slider. I would say this is a pretty smart way of separating them better in order not to well mess up and press another one by mistake. As you can see, each notification has its own card now, individual cards, and you can sort notifications by time instead of priority. We also have an improved and larger music player here, which uh, now shows uh, the artwork in a better manner, in a sexier manner, I would say, maybe perhaps inspired by iOS. Now, aside from that, the lock screen has received some changes, uh, which are once again inspired by iOS. And uh, with the lock screen, um, you should be able to do a lot of tweaking. We have the lock screen here. You can edit the wallpapers, but you can also edit the widgets available, including the clock widget, which now is more easy to move around. You should also be able to trigger various lock screens for various modes. When I say modes, I'm talking about the modes and routines triggered by certain placements of the user, time of the, times of the day, or interconnection with smart objects around the house. So yeah, um, there's also something new here, which will only uncover if you go to a certain app, let's say gallery, press here and see, go to studio. There's a new video studio application, which lets you start a project, pick a few videos and photos, and then you can create your own video and start editing it with a few extra features. I would say it's pretty hidden for the average user, but yeah, it's there. It's a video studio and you got the options to play with stuff. Okay, another new thing here in uh, One UI 6, is in the security section. You go here, aside from biometrics, account security, app security, there's a new thing called auto blocker. It blocks you from installing apps from third parties and it blocks software updates via USB cable or basically hacking your phone via USB cable, better said. We also have new widgets. So if you keep the screen pressed like this, you can go here, widgets. As you can see, they're quite pretty. Widgets have become pretty even since One UI 4 or 5. But there's a new weather widget, which is much sexier now, offering more details, dynamic weather and weather insight. This is actually the new widget, which I actually enjoy a lot. 
and the weather app has changed its design as well. Okay, and we also have a new camera widget which takes you straight to a mode, a capture mode, so you can get going. There's also a new font available throughout the interface, which is easier on the eye, if you ask me. We talk about recents, there's split screen, there's pop-up windows, and of course, the Samsung phones means we also have this edge thing going on with a predefined split screen, for example. Now, if you go into the settings, you're going to find some familiar options like connections, connected devices here. Everything is gathered here. Quick share, music share, auto switch buds, call and text on other devices, continue apps, link to Windows, multi-control. Samsung DeX is still a thing, so you can get the desktop experience uh, via mouse, keyboard and a screen and smart view and smart things and android auto all of them are here modes and routines as i said before this can be reflected on your lock screen and then we have the battery area which also handles performance somehow charging settings wireless power sharing wallpaper and style with the whole color palette from android 13 onwards themes are available security and privacy with the lock screen, account security, loss device protection, app protection and updates, permissions and so forth, advanced features, labs, side button, multi-window, options and motions and gestures, one hand mode, Bixby, video call effects and dual messengers, plus of course device care, this is the area where we can allocate maybe extra storage, uh, tweak the battery and the, well, there's also the maintenance mode there if you're leaving the phone in for repairs. Finally, there's accessibility and digital well-being and parental control. As far as the pre-installed apps go, we have here the classic Samsung setup, Galaxy Shop, SmartThings, Voice Recorder, My Files, the internet browser and the health, wearable and AR zone. This is the Google selection and the Microsoft One with 365 OneDrive, LinkedIn and Outlook. Then we have the Play Store, Members, Store, Facebook, Spotify, Netflix, and I would say that's pretty much it, as well as YouTube Music, a note-taking application, and Gaming Hub, when actually you can create profiles and do tweaks to the games you have here to improve your gaming experience. I would say that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Don't forget that you're getting four years of Android updates on this device, which is actually not that bad. Now, when it comes to the pros and cons, yes, it's time for the verdict. On the pro side, it's a phone with a premium build, IP68 certification, it's got a very bright screen, an okay performance and very, very good speakers. At the same time, I should probably also mention that um, the battery is superior to the one of the predecessor and uh, that the camera is a good all-rounder, particularly the main camera is satisfying. Fast connectivity, lovely UI and four years of updates. Those are the pros. On the cons, no charger in the box. It's a bit big for a 6.4 inch phone. It produces some heat and throttling and the battery is a letdown compared to what the rivals are offering. Xiaomi 13T Pro, nothing phone 2 and Honor 90. The nighttime capture is a bit of a bummer without night mode and video nighttime capture is a bummer as well. Super steady and food mode feel a bit useless and uh, I feel that the videos aren't as crisp as the ones of the rivals. So yeah, and it's closer to the S22 series if you're being honest compared to the um, S23 series which bears its name. Now, in the end, I should uh, advise you to wait for a price reduction if you really want this phone. It's good for its interface and music and the screen, plus the main camera pictures. You're going to choose this instead of the Nothing Phone 2, Xiaomi 13T Pro or Honor 90, based on the interface, probably, and also based on the main camera and screen. However, Exynos, not my favorite CPU, and everybody knows why. Not as good as a Snapdragon. So in the end, the CPU may determine your choice. That's it from us. This has been the review of the Samsung Galaxy S23 FE 5G. Goodbye.